Hi folks, this is Dr. Pickett. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and do my sort of initial presentation on three-factor mapping. Hopefully this will uh, be helpful to some of you guys who have asked me uh, some questions both in office hours and online about three-factor mapping. I know it can be somewhat confusing. What are the two areas that we're going to cover today in some detail? Thinking about <clears throat> alternative cis-trans orientations of alleles and how those can uh, have a differential impact on what type of gametes we would expect in terms of single recombinant and double recombinant gametes. Then I thought it would also be fun to go through some of uh, Alfred Sturdivant's uh, early data, uh, I think from 1911 or 1913, uh, doing three-factor mapping on the X chromosome using some alleles that we've talked, some genes and alleles that we've talked about previously and some new ones. So we'll see how it goes. Um, prior to starting though, again, here's my contact information uh, with a clickable link for my email and a clickable link for my phone. And I'll post those as, uh, that as a PowerPoint presentation here in just a bit. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and get started. So <clears throat> just as a reminder, until we have established a map, we have no idea really what the possible linear order uh, of three genes is along a chromosome. And so for any three genes, there are only three possibilities. If we think about gene A, gene B, and gene C, uh, we can describe, so I'm sorry, let me get my little laser pointer up here we can describe this linear order as A adjacent to B adjacent to C. Gene B here is in the middle. Thus, there are two mapping intervals that we're concerned with in this region, the gene A to gene B interval, and then the gene B to gene C interval. Now, once we have those two map distances, we'll be able to describe the entire A through C region, uh, and we can also certainly map A and C in relation to each other as well. We won't do that in the context of this exercise, but I know uh, your book is also concerned with having you do that, looking at the total recombinants in this interval. We'll break that down in just a bit. What are the other <clears throat> possibilities that we can deal with here? Well, obviously, if gene B isn't in the middle, but there are only three genes, there are other alternative orders. In this case, gene A is adjacent to C, adjacent to B, and in the A to B region of this chromosome, gene C lies in the middle of that interval or lies between those two genes. We don't know what the relative distance is at any point uh, for any you know, of the two intervals in this case. If this was the actual linear order now, if we were talking about our sort of single recombinant regions, we would have the A to C interval and the C to B interval. Um, notice now with C in the middle, our interval designations have changed. We now have an A to C where we'll see single recombinants, a C to B where we'll see single recombinants, and if we see a situation where only the alleles of gene C exchange, we'll know that's the double recombinant. So if we were to compare these two linear orders, uh, recombinations involving only alleles at B in this first case would be the double recombinant events. Those would create double recombinant gametes and offspring. In this situation where C is in the middle, the only way that alleles at C alone could exchange is if um, there is a double recombinant in the A to C and C to B interval, if that makes sense. What's the last possibility for these three genes? Well, in our first situation, B is in the middle, second C. The only remaining alternative would be for gene B, excuse me, A to B in the middle. In that case, our two intervals now are the B to A single recombinant interval, the A to C interval, gene A is in the middle, but our 
Single recombinants or double recombinants change with each of these orders, if that makes sense. Because I feel like folks were kind of struggling with this idea that, well, we know what the three genes are. Before you do mapping, you do not know what uh, the relative orientation is. And with three genes, any of these types of three possibilities are possible. Only after you do the experiment will you be able to assign the gene in the middle and then the two mapping intervals. <clears throat> now, we would describe these regions differently as well. We would say here we have a region in our first case where gene B is in the middle flanked by A and C. Here C is in the middle flanked by A and B. Here A is in the middle flanked by B and C. Note we're only describing these orientations in relation to each other. This orientation is the same. This first one is the same as if I was to say the linear map order is CBA along the chromosome. Because notice, I'm not giving you any outside references. There are no other landmarks along the chromosome. I'm not telling you where the centromere is or where the telomere is, if that makes sense. So in, these, in this world of three gene mapping, unless we're bringing in other information from the chromosome, the only orientations we care about are the genes in relation to each other. A, B, C is the linear order that is identical even if the linear order is CBA in relation to some broader chromosomal landmarks, if that makes sense. Where things get important is when we're mapping to other genes that lie outside of this immediate region, or we're mapping to the centromere or the telomere. But for the purposes of three-factor mapping, of three-gene mapping, um, once we determine the gene is in the middle, we've determined the relative order. But there are two alternative equiprobable orders, like in this case, ABC versus CBA. Those orders are identical if we're only talking about three landmarks. A is adjacent to B and C if we say ABC. Similarly, A is adjacent to B is adjacent to C if we say CBA as our order. So I just want to put that out there. I think folks were getting a little confused about mapping this in relation to centromeres, which we're really not doing in the context of this particular course, although you might do that in more advanced genetics. Now, <clears throat> let's kind of explore this concept of the cis-trans orientation of alleles a little more closely as well, because we'll see that for a given gene order, there are a fair number of possibilities in terms of the cis-trans orientation, which alleles of the genes are present on the same homolog, uh, depending on uh, the starting structures of the lines, et cetera. And we'll see that that cis-trans orientation of alleles has a major impact on um, the single recombinant classes of chromosomes that we get out and progeny and the double recombinants that we get out. Okay, so here let's look at our actual gene order. Gene A is adjacent to gene B, adjacent to gene C. But now the question is, if we have a mapping cross, we know with mapping crosses we must have a heterozygosity for all of the genes under consideration, if we have homozygosity for the homozygous locus, the homozygous gene, we cannot include that in a mapping combination or a mapping study because we cannot detect recombinants. We have to have a heterozygosity at all genes under consideration to identify recombinants in this type of cross. So here we've got our known order, A adjacent to B adjacent to C. But what are the possible cis-trans orientation of alleles that we might have in a typical triple heterozygote that we could use for a mapping cross? Well, one possibility, this first situation, 
all of the dominance in cis on one homolog in trans to all of the recessives in cis. Now, your book describes this using coupling and repulsion orientation language. I prefer to just say all dominance in cis in trans to all recessives in cis. Now, what does that mean? All of the dominant alleles are present on the same DNA helix, <clears throat> the same homolog uh, in this heterozygote, in contrast to all of the recessive alleles, which are present on the alternative copy of the chromosome. How would we describe this? Big A insists to big B insists to big C, or if those are the wild type alleles, we could say, Wild type at A, wild type at B, insist to wild type at C, are in trans two, recessive at A, recessive at B, recessive at C. Now, note, this is just one possible orientation. With three genes, two alleles for each gene, six alleles in possible, another potential parental cis-trans orientation of alleles would be to have dominant at A, insist to recessive at B, insist to dominant at C, and trans two, recessive at A, insist to dominant at B, insist to recessive at C. So here we have triple heterozygotes, big A, little a, big B, little b, big C, little c. Here's another triple heterozygote, big A over little a, big B over little b, big C over little c, but because the cis-trans orientation of alleles has changed, the expectations for both the single recombinant gamete class and the double recombinant gamete, I should say the single recombinant gamete classes, I'm only going to do recombinants in one interval here. I'll let you guys do the recombinants in the other interval. <clears throat> but the uh, genotype of the gametes that are single recombinants and double recombinants will change based on the cis-trans orientation of alleles, and we'll see this in just a second. Now, what's another possibility in this case, if we're just kind of considering uh, the BC interval? Well, we might have big A insist to big B insist to little c in trans 2, Little a insists to little b insists to big C. So, you know, here we're kind of mixing things up. Now, what we'll see is with these alternatives, and, you know, obviously you guys will be able to think of other possible alternatives, alternatives for the A, B interval, not a problem. Um, feel free to explore, but I just want to go through these a bit so we can see. Now, in the first situation where we have all dominants in cis and trans to all recessives in cis, if we have a single recombination in the BC interval, what are the type of gametes that are produced? Well, let's go ahead and invoke our recombination event. We know when we have a chiasmata, it's a, it's a bridge we must cross in both ways when we come to it. So what are the gametes that would be produced or the gamete genotypes? The chromosomes that would be produced by that type of recombination, well, one would be big A insists to big B, now insists to little c, as we cross the recombination bridge and go and retrieve little c from the other homolog. But remember, recombination crossover points are bridges we must cross in both directions. Thus, the other chromosome that we would simultaneously produce they call it the reciprocal chromosome. It's a little peculiar, but it makes sense. Little a insists to little b, going up and retrieving big C from the other homolog would give us our expected single recombinant gamete, little a, little b, big C. Is that what we expect? You betcha. Coming out of that recombination event, one Recombinant chromosome would be big A insists to big B insists to little c. Now remember, if we only have a single crossover event, including two uh, chromatids, only two of the four chromatids would be recombinant. Thus here we're showing the recombinant chromatids. The other two chromatids would still be parental in this case. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so the recombinant chromatids would be big A insists to big B, now insists to little c. The other recombinant chromatid is little a insists to little b, now insists to big C. So recombinations in the BC interval will exchange alleles at C, but alleles at A and B will stay in their parental cis-trans orientation. Here big A is insist to big B, here big A is still insist to big B. The only locus that has exchanged alleles in this case is the C locus. Now what would we expect for the double recombinant gametes? So here our single recombinant gamete genotype, one is big A, big B, little c, the other gamete is little a, little b, big c. What are our double recombinants? Well, if we have a double recombinant with this starting cis-trans orientation, all dominants in cis, in trans to all recessives in cis. Now again, we must cross every bridge we come to. So this homolog will be big A, little b, big c. That would give us a big A, little b, big c uh, gamete genotype. Since we will simultaneously be exchanging, or since we will be exchanging the alleles at B, what will that give us for our other homolog? Little a, going up and snagging big B, then coming back down to little c. Little a, big B, big c. Is that what we would expect to see? You bet. If we have a double recombinant, given this cis-trans orientation of alleles, our gamete genotype should be big A, little b, big C, or little a, big b, little c. Now, note, these gametes will be generated at the single recombinant rate for the BC interval. Those gametes would be generated at the rate that this recombination occurs. These gametes will be produced at the double recombination rate because two events have to happen statistically independently, although we know we have a test for independence later on when we look for interference. <clears throat> but in this situation, we would anticipate these gamete genotypes, big A, little b, big C, or little a, big b, little c, to be amongst the rarest gametes, well, to be the rarest gametes that we would produce. Given statistical independence, if we've got two rates, the AB interval rate and the BC interval rate, this would be expected to occur at a maximum, nearly, rate of the two interval rates multiplied together, unless, as we see, we have negative interference, which we'll talk about in just a bit. Now, what if our cis-trans orientation was different? How would our single recombinants in the BC interval, how would those genotypes change? And how would the double recombinant gamete genotypes change? Well, if we had rather than all dominants in cis to all trans, a situation where dominant at A and C was cis to recessive at B, in trans to recessive at A and C and cis to dominant at B, our single recombinants in the BC interval will now change their genotype. Maintaining parental orientation, big A and little b would stay in cis, but little b would move into big A and little b would move into cis with little c. Little a and big B would stay in cis, preserving their parental cis-trans orientation, and they would move into cis with big C. What are expected single recombinant gamete genotypes? Big A, little b, little c. Note how this changes in relation to the previous situation where the cis-trans orientation was different. Big A, little b, little c. The other alternative that should be produced are the little a, big b, big c. Simply with a change in cis-trans orientation of alleles in the parent whose recombination rate we're assessing, we end up changing um, the single recombinant genotype gametes and because those gamete genotypes are changing when we complete our test cross, the phenotype of the resulting offspring would change as well. 
after a test cross here, the phenotype would be dominant or wild type at A and B, but homozygous or hemizygous recessive at C. So the phenotype would be little c, little c. Here we would have a little a, little a, little b, little b, double homozygous recessive phenotype. And then we would be heterozygous big C, little c at the C locus. Thus our phenotype would be wild type for the C character, but homozygous recessive for A and B. Let's contrast that with this situation where a single recombinant in the interval between B and C produces a double homozygous recessive or double hemizygous recessive BC phenotype, but heterozygous or hemizygous dominant at A. <clears throat> the other possible phenotype, homozygous or hemizygous recessive at A, heterozygous dominant or hemizygous dominant at B and C. What is the double recombinant class given this cis-trans orientation of alleles? Well, big A moves down to get big B, comes back to get big C. Little a goes up to get little B, comes down to get little C. Thus, what is a parental gamete genotype and parental offspring phenotype for a heterozygote in which all dominants are cis in trans to all recessives in cis, now becomes a gamete genotype and offspring phenotype, um, all dominants in cis. The other, so these are all heterozygous or homozygous dominant in terms of the offspring that that gamete will produce. They'll either be big A, little a, big B, little b, big C, little c offspring, or big A, big B, big C, and trans to the Y male offspring if those are produced. The other uh, group of double recombinant progeny should be homozygous or hemizygous recessive at A, B, and C in terms of their offspring phenotype all recessives in cis in terms of their gamete uh, genotype. So this is quite fascinating. The cis-trans orientation of alleles in the triple heterozygous, here I'm calling them typical heterozygotes, but our triple heterozygous parents determine single recombinant gamete genotypes and offspring phenotypes, and also double recombinant. These individuals will, will occur at a much lower rate these individuals will be generated at the rate of single recombination. Only one of these crossover bridges has to be produced to produce these gamete types. These individuals will be produced at the double recombinant rate. Last but not least, an orientation here where we uh, <clears throat> uh, flip uh, not the middle locus, uh, but the uh, uh, locus on the end. What is our cis-trans orientation? Big A, big B, little c in trans 2, little a, little b, big C. If we have a single recombination, what do we do? In this case, all of the dominants in cis in one homolog, all of the recessives in cis in the other homolog is a gamete genotype that's produced by single recombination, thus, a genotype that is in one organism parental in another organism based on cis-trans orientation of alleles produces the double recombinant event in yet a third cis-trans orientation of alleles in the triple heterozygote produces single recombinant gametes and single recombinant classes. Um, what is the double recombinant in this case? Well, Simple enough to do. Big A moves down to select little b, moves up to select little c. Little A moves up to get big B, moves down to get big C. Thus, the double recombinant gamete genotypes and the resulting offspring phenotypes are big A, big B, little c, or little a, little b, big c. So it's quite fascinating. We have different gamete genotypes 
that represent different parental or non-parental slash recombinant uh, types of chromosomes, um, which derive ultimately from the cis-trans orientation in the parent. All of these types of cis-trans orientations are possible. The only way we will detect them is by examining the double recombinant gametes, which tell us which gene is in the middle. These will all always be producing the rarest or lowest frequency offspring class. Um, those individuals will identify by their rarity uh, that the unique gamete genotypes that produce them uh, are caused by the rarest type of event, the double recombination event. So <clears throat> I thought it would be fun to do, uh, I, I say a few fun examples, but one example from Alfred Sturdivant. Uh, this is from one of the original um, X-linked mapping papers in Drosophila. This paper concerned mapping sex-linked genes, so we're going to be on the X. Uh, this is a really famous mapping of vermilion with the cut or cut wing locus and the cross veinless locus. Now, you'll remember from our previous exercise in class um, that we looked at skewt, we looked at cross-veinless and the kinus. So in our previous situation, we had homozygous recessive phenotypes or hemizygous recessive male phenotypes where uh, the bristles looked singed, the eyes were abnormal and the wings didn't have cross veins. Well, we've carried over cross veinless, but now we're looking at bright red eyes and cut wings in the homozygous recessives or the hemizygous recessive males. So in this situation, the vermilion allele is recessive to its wild type allele. The cut wings allele is recessive to its wild type not cut, they, they sort of look like they have an indentation because they're missing some sensory structures. And the cross-veinless wings, as we already discussed, in homozygotes, you do not see the cross veins uh, in the Drosophila wings. Um, all of the mutant-associated alleles that we will discuss today for these three different genes are recessive to the wild-type alleles. In a species typical fly that has the wild type alleles present in at least heterozygotes, the eyes are red, not vermilion. The wings are entire, not cut. They don't have divots in them. And the wings have cross veins. They are not cross veinless. So the crossing test that was done was interesting. Um, before we did the experiment, we were not given any information about the cis-trans orientation of alleles. So we're going to have to discern everything about the cross, uh, except the fact that we had a triple heterozygote, which was a given. We're gonna have to discern everything about the cross from the data. So what we knew is that we were homozygous, Brian, excuse me, we were heterozygous at vermilion in a female, heterozygous cross veinless, recessive and plus uh, in a female and cut heterozygous recessive over plus. Um, so this female was wild type in terms of her phenotype. Her eye color was red, not vermilion. Her wings had cross veins because she was heterozygous dominant for the wild type allele. Her wings were entire. They had a normal boundary. They were not cut because she was heterozygous, cut wild type, overcut recessive. The tester male that was used in this cross was a vermilion cross veinless cut male in terms of the phenotype. We had already determined, or it had already been determined, that these were excellent linked genes. Thus, we can describe the cis-trans orientation of alleles of the male, given that he only has one copy of the vermilion, the cross veinless, and the cut gene. The cis-trans orientation of alleles on his X carrying the recessive alleles had to be 
vermilion and cyst across veinless and cyst to cut, all recessive, in trans to the Y chromosome. Because remember, males only have one X chromosome here and the Y. So the fact that we have a vermilion cross veinless cut male as a tester uh, uh, parent means that <clears throat> we know the cis trans orientation of alleles in that case. All recessives in cis and trans to the Y. The Y does not have a copy of vermilion cut or cross veinless. Thus, this is a hemizygous recessive individual. So what were our unknowns before the cross started? We did not know the cis trans orientation in this triple heterozygous female. We don't know if it's all recessives in cis and trans to all dominants in cis, or if there is a combination of one or the other uh, uh, recessive alleles uh, linked to in cis with uh, dominant alleles. So we do not know the cis trans orientation of alleles in the females. We just don't know. We don't know the relative linear order along the chromosome. Sturdivant wrote out the gene genotypes this way, but it did not imply order. We don't know if vermilion is going to be in the middle, cross veinless is going to be in the middle, or cut is going to be in the middle. Also, once we determine which is the middle gene, uh, we don't know at this point, any information about the map units between them. So this was the cross that was done. A wild type triple heterozygous female crossed to a tester male that was vermilion cross veinless cut. Um, recombination or not was allowed to occur in the triple heterozygous female and offspring were counted. And what was the pattern that we saw? Well, we saw an overrepresentation of vermilion, so homozygous little v <laughs> or v minus, vermilion, but wild type at cross veinless cut flies. So we would describe these flies based on their phenotype if we were only discussing the mutant phenotypes as vermilion, otherwise wild type. And we saw an overrepresentation, 592 out of the total, of cross veinless cut homozygous recessive or hemizygous recessive if male flies, um, but wild type at vermilion. So, how would we describe the overall phenotypes of these two most common flies? Well, we would describe them as vermilion or cross veinless cut. Now, we know that the most common offspring are produced by non-recombinant chromosomes. Unless we have independent assortment, <laughs> which we don't have in this case, unless we have independent assortment, we're going to see um, an overrepresentation of non-recombinant chromosomes. Now, that allows us to say something about the cis-trans orientation of alleles. It doesn't let us say anything about um, the linear order of the genes, but it does allow us to at least say one thing. If we had vermilion along with the wild-type copy of cross-veinless and the wild-type copy of cut together, we know, oops, I'm sorry, let me go ahead and get my pen here. We know that one of these chromosomes had to be, there we're going to draw the chromosome, had to have the recessive allele at vermilion, the wild type allele at cross veinless. I'm a terrible drawer. <laughs> Sorry. And the wild type allele at cut. That's a T, not a plus, but we're going to put a plus up there. In trans two, V plus, well, that's reassuring because that wild type allele of vermilion had to be somewhere. But since we were cross veinless and cut in these flies, we know that for the cross veinless locus, it was 
mutant recessive. And we know for the cut locus, mom was uh, recessive at that gene too. So mom was wild type in phenotype. Let me go back and get my little, little thingy here. Mom was wild type in overall phenotype, and she was a triple heterozygote. But her cis trans orientation of alleles was not all dominance in cis in trans to all recessives. She had recessive at vermilion in cis to cross veinless wild type, in cis to cut wild type. In trans 2, vermilion plus, vermilion wild type, cross veinless recessive, cut recessive. Does that make sense? So she is a triple heterozygous, cut plus over minus, cross veinless plus over minus, vermilion plus over minus. Her eyes are red. Her wings have cross veins. Her wings are entire. They have a wing shape. They don't have any divots dug out of it because she is heterozygous wild type at all of those. Now, let's kind of work through this and ask ourselves this question. Now that we know the cis-trans orientation of alleles in this original triple heterozygous parent, which gene is in the middle? Well, now we have to look not at our most common class, showing our parental or non-recombinant gamete offspring, right? So thinking about these offspring, this offspring is either V minus over V minus, CV plus over V over CV minus, CT plus over CT minus, or V minus CV plus, CT plus over the Y. Um, but now we have to look down here at the rarest class, that that is underrepresented. These are the flies that are produced by double recombination. What is their phenotype and what gamete genotypes from this parent up here um, had to have been done to produce them? Well, if we compare this set of alleles, recessive at vermilion with cross veinless plus recessive at cut, let's compare that to the chromosomes that were parental. Well, there's recessive at vermilion, there's recessive at vermilion, there's wild type at uh, cross veinless, there's wild type at cross veinless. So the cis trans orientation of alleles here is the same as it is in the parental class, is the same as it was in the non-recombinant chromosome in mom. So vermilion recessive in cis to cross veinless plus, that cis trans orientation is preserved. Which gene has exchanged alleles? Well, note that although vermilion recessive is in cis to cross veinless plus, here the cut locus rather than being cut plus, as it was in the mother, is now cut recessive, CT minus, right there. Ah, the gene that exchanged alleles at the lowest frequency in the offspring, the gamete that is produced at the lowest frequency by meiosis in this triply heterozygous mother is the gamete in which the cut allele appears to have exchanged, or the cut locus has appeared to exchange alleles. So now let's think about that. If that makes sense, every time we exchange, there should be a reciprocal. What about the other rare class? Well, let's look at it. Here we see vermilion plus and cross veinless recessive together here we see vermilion plus and cross veinless recessive together. But what's going on at the cut locus? Ah, in the triple heterozygous mother, vermilion plus and cross veinless recessive were in cis to cut recessive. Here, all of a sudden, we're seeing them both with cut plus. This indicates that the uh, gene that exchanges alle alleles at the lowest frequency 
in this cross is the cut locus. Remember, in order to do something at the lowest frequency when we're dealing with three-factor mapping, excuse me, um, we've got to uh, do two recombination events. That means we now have to redraw the linear order of alleles on this chromosome. Let's redraw mom's uh, genotype. I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing my cursor. So mom's genotype must have really been this, V minus cut plus So cross veinless plus in trans two, because I mean she was a triple heterozygote, vermilion plus cut minus cross veinless recessive. Okay, does that make sense? So this is the real cis-trans orientation of alleles, although <laughs> Sturdevant, for whatever reason, put cross veinless in the middle as he was, oops, excuse me, I'm, for some reason I'm having a little bit of an issue there. Um, although he put cross veinless just by the way he wrote out the genotype, he was kind of implying it was in the middle. That was actually not correct. Cut was really the gene in the middle. The parental cis-trans orientation of alleles was recessive at vermilion and cis to wild type at cut and cis to cross veinless wild type. In trans two, wild type at vermilion, cut recessive, cross veinless recessive. So now we have two intervals in which we need to do our mapping. We have a vermilion cut interval and a cut cross veinless interval, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna let you guys do that. I just gave you a little bit of a uh, setup here. We've already done one and two. We identified the parental non-recombinant offspring and we use those to at least establish the cis-trans orientation of alleles. We then identified the double recombinant offspring and we rewrote the linear order of the genes in the triple heterozygous genotype. Now I want you guys to do four, five, and six. Um, I encourage you to work together and I hope this is helpful to your thinking. Uh, but starting there, once we put the gene in the middle and we rewrite mom's genotype with the correct, not only cis-trans orientation of alleles, but linear order of the genes, then it becomes very easy to go, oh, well, if there's a recombination in the vermilion cut interval, the, these are the gametes that would be produced. If there's a recombination in the cut cross veinless interval, these are the recombinations that would be produced, et cetera. So anyway, my friends, I hope that's helpful. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, please let me know if there are any other issues. Uh, soon we will be uh, meeting to do our synchronous and then later uh, asynchronous discussion as well. I'm futzing around a little, excuse me, messing around a little bit today with uh, Panopto and Zoom, and we should be ready to go tomorrow at our normal class time. Remember that all class times in Chicago are CST, Central Standard Time. So we will be meeting at our Chicago time for the class. Um, I will send an alert out and try to make sure that everybody is on board. I'm also gonna send some more email out today. I hope to post this and the presentation for you soon. Um, this is a great uh, study guide for our exam. At this point, our exam will obviously be scheduled either next week or at a week uh, fairly soon in the future. I'm still waiting to hear from the administration about final issues about the withdrawal date. I did send a note uh, that got forwarded on to the provost, so hopefully we will hear soon. 
I will give you as much information as I can as soon as I can. I hope you are all well. I am beaming positive thoughts your way. I hope this is useful. Have a good day, my friends. Bye-bye.